I'm Mimi Meredith, your host this morning for Coffee at the Cosmo, coming to you from the Cosmosphere, although it might appear that I've transported myself down to Houston to Johnson Space Center and the Historic Mission Operations Control Room. In fact, many of you probably are aware that Cosmosphere's Space Works Division was responsible for the restoration of all of the, of all of the consoles that you see behind me, including the console where Jerry Griffin, our guest for this morning, sat as flight director for Apollo missions. Coming to you this morning, we have some great topics, including those from Jerry. Hello, Jerry. Hello but first, there. I want to tell you a little bit more about this room that I'm in. We're able to do things like project this great background because we've developed a streaming room at the Cosmosphere where we'll be sharing content with teachers and classrooms, live science demonstrations, all kinds of content that reinforces what teachers want to teach in ways that only the Cosmosphere can deliver with great STEM hands-on activities and more. We're also going to be de developing virtual training for teachers in partnership with Hutchinson Community College. And of course, we always will have virtual training like today, where our focus is anyone interested in space, but also business leaders who can learn today from the likes of none other than Mr. Jerry Griffin, Emmy Award, I'm sorry, we're having technical difficulties. Folks, hold on one second so we can make sure everybody's with us. Sandy is an Emmy Award winning producer and writer with 20 years experience in helping companies tell stories and work together in better ways. He's a partner at Norman Howard, a Toronto based digital content shop. He previously served as vice president at Second City Works, which is the business to business arm of the world famous Second City, where the likes of Saturday Night Live was born. Over the years, Sandy has helped executives of companies like Morgan Stanley, General Electric, Abbott Laboratories, The Home Depot and Verizon apply the principles of improvisation to their business leadership. As a film and television actor, Sandy appeared on The Odd Squad, on Comedy Central, in Ron Howard's The Dilemma alongside Vince Vaughn, and as the scientist for ExxonMobil's ongoing campaigns. I watch for him every time those commercials come on. I feel like Sandy can legitimately tell me about what's in my gasoline. Media appearances include Fast Company, CBC News, and as a five-time five jurist for the BAMP Media Awards. He's a lifelong space enthusiast, and he uh, has co-created a wonderful podcast called Reach, a space podcast for kids. It's now in its second season, and I encourage you to tune in with your kids. He volunteers as a solar system ambassador for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and is a proud alum of the Cosmosphere Camps, where he also served as a camp counselor. Sandy holds a BA in history from Drake University, where he later served as a trustee, and he's a dual citizen of the United States and Canada. Sandy will be our host today, talking with none other than the great Jerry Griffin. Jerry is the former director of the NASA Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center in Houston. He also served NASA as the deputy director of the John F. Kennedy Space Center in Florida and the Hugh F. Dryden, now Neil Armstrong, Flight Research Center in California. At NASA headquarters in Washington, DC, Jerry also held the post of an assistant administrator, easy for me to say, for legislative affairs, associate administrator for external relations, and deputy associate administrator for space flight operations. His career in NASA began as a flight controller in mission control, specializing in guidance, navigation, and control systems for Project Gemini, or Gemini. You'll have to tell me which you prefer, Jerry, because everybody says it either way. He also worked on the early unmanned missions for the Apollo program. I say it both ways. <laughs> the flight director for all of the Apollo program manned missions, including all nine manned missions to the moon, six of which included lunar landings. Jerry was the lead flight director for Apollo 12, Apollo 15, and Apollo 17. His gold team conducted the lunar landings made during Apollo 14, 16, and 17. That's half the lunar landings for those of you keeping track at home. Jerry's team was scheduled to conduct the landing of Apollo 13 on the moon, but when that landing was canceled as a result of an oxygen tank explosion, which we'll get into in a lot of detail in just a little bit, 
His goal team was one of the four teams who played the key roles in the safe return of those three astronauts. Jerry earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Aeronautical Engineering from Texas A&M. Did I get that right, Jerry? Got the thumb right. And he'll tell you right. more about that later too. And was commissioned as an officer in the United States Air Force. He served four years on active duty, first in flight training, then flying as a weapons systems officer in jet flight interceptors. Jerry left active duty and joined the space program as a systems engineer and flight controller at the USAF Satellite Test Center in Sunnyvale, California. He also was a senior aerospace engineer with General Dynamics in Fort Worth before joining NASA. When he left NASA, as if Jerry hadn't done enough already, he went into the private sector to become president and CEO of the Greater Houston Chamber of Commerce, a post he held until he joined Corn Ferry International, a worldwide executive search firm as a managing director of the firm's Houston office. Today, Jerry is a technical and management consultant for a broad range of clients. He remains a senior consultant for Corn Ferry, where he conducts search assignments for very senior level executives, primarily in the firm's global aerospace and defense practice. He's a member of the advisory board of the Alpha Space LLC, a trustee of Shriner University, and a member of the advisory board of the Texas A&M Engineering Experiment Station. Because of his real life role as flight director during the flight of Apollo 13, Jerry was a technical advisor for the movie Apollo 13. Later, he was a technical advisor for and an actor in the movies Contact and Deep Impact. And he was a technical advisor for the movie Apollo 18. Jerry and his wife, Sandy, live in Hunt, Texas. And I'm going to turn it over to Sandy Marshall, who will lead us through this and more that Jerry has done that can teach all of us lessons from mission control. Mimi, thank you so much for the fantastic intro. And Jerry, good morning. Good morning, Sandy. How are you? I'm great. I have my coffee in my um, very special Saturn V mug right here. So it's fully themed. You have your coffee ready? <laughs> I'm ready. I'm You're good ready. To go? That's great. I'm going to share my screen here. I'm good. I'm good. You're good? Go for okay. launch. You go for launch? Okay, excellent. I'm going to share the screen so we can go ahead and um, take a look at this fantastic presentation. We're, we're so honored to be with you this morning. And also a big thanks to Mimi and everybody at the Cosmosphere for uh, putting on this presentation, but then also just doing everything you do. Um, so Jerry, can you see this? Um, can you see the screen? I Jerry? can. Fantastic, the big good morning. Wonderful. Uh, and we, you can see the big slide, right? Not our internal slide. You you see the big one there. Wonderful. Where it's such a such right. an honor to be right. here with everybody that, this morning. Right. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, well, Mimi, thank you so much for the fantastic intro. We're we're just honored to be a part of this event, and we're going to be talking about leadership lessons that we can learn from the mission control environment, particularly on the Apollo missions, which is why we're so excited to have the great Jerry Griffin with us this morning. It's always a pleasure to be collaborating with the great folks at the Cosmosphere. And when I personally was growing up in Hiawatha, Kansas and spending many summers in the Midwest, I was super lucky to get to go to the Cosmosphere camps and later work there as a counselor. Um, in fact, the slide here that you can see is the cover from one of our vintage camp training manuals. And as you can see, it says, Nothing is impossible and teamwork is key. I think that is very cool. And that's two of the key concepts we're gonna be talking about today. I do have one quick Cosmosphere short story to share. Um, a while back, as Mimi mentioned, I was working on a Ron Howard movie with Vince Vaughn and Ron's younger brother, Clint. And when we were on a break, I said, Ron, I gotta ask you about Apollo 13 because I was working at the Cosmosphere at the time when they were making the set pieces for the movie. And he lit right up. And Ron said, you know, man, I love the Cosmosphere. They are so fantastic to work with. What a great institution and organization. And I got to tell you, he said, I made a lot of movies, but when that one comes on TV, I watch it all the way through to the very end. And I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, but Jerry, you have lived the Apollo 13 experience, and we're really excited to hear about that. What we can learn from you as lead flight director in Apollo 12, 15, and 17, and also from your role in returning the astronauts on Apollo 13. Um, and certainly your gold team, as Mimi mentioned, conducted half the lunar landings during Apollo. And I noticed that Apollo 14 is nearing its 50th anniversary. So 
happy early 50th for Apollo 13 coming up very quickly. That's pretty cool. So let's kick off with a quick overview of what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be talking about leadership lessons from mission control. And we're going to learn all about what made these Apollo missions, particularly the mission control environment, so successful. We're going to share some insights about managing risk and working as a team. And along the way, we'll share a few pro tips and takeaways about what anybody can learn about the principles of improvisation. And anybody tuning in, we're going to have plenty of time at the end for questions for Jerry. So please feel free to ask those in the comments or the chat box. And Jerry, if we have time at the end, we might get to hear your picks for the Super Bowl. We'll see if we have time. That might be a longer conversation, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll see if we get time. Uh, let's kick it off with Apollo 12, Jerry. So okay. in the 1960s, NASA landed the first astronauts on the moon on July 20th. 1969 as part of the Apollo 11 mission. And the next mission to the moon, which was Apollo 12, launched on November 14th, 1969. So you were working as flight director on Apollo 12. And about 30 seconds after liftoff, with the world watching, lightning literally struck with a Saturn V rocket, requiring a very well-known split second solution. I was wondering if you could walk through what happened, what you did, and you know what we could take away from that moment? Well, um, as you mentioned, Apollo 12 was uh, a very exciting uh, beginning. Um, it was my first time to be on the console, flight director console, uh, for a launch, the Saturn V, which was always, always uh, extremely uh, let me say, uh, white knuckle time. Uh, you grew after a while to kind of relax the white knuckles, but an awful lot of energy stored up. Uh, they were sitting on about six and a half million pounds of high propellant, high, high explosive propellant that if it ever got mixed together, uh, you had chaos. So launches from uh, on the Saturn were, were extremely, uh, let me say, interesting. And this one started very nicely. Uh, I thought uh, we were going to have a great launch. And uh, about as you say, 30 some odd seconds, all of a sudden, our data completely froze up in the control center. And it was just garbage on our screens. <clears throat> there was a young guy named uh, John Aaron, uh, 20s, Oklahoma, uh, that knew that system inside and out, that knew the data system, knew the electrical system. His position was called ECOM, E-E-C-O-M, Electrical Environmental Communications. John, uh, interesting, uh, he immediately, he kind of turned around and looked at me. He sat right below uh, row down and he said flight ask him to tell him to try SCE to aux it was a switch I had never heard of um, and this is the first lesson I think uh, of leadership and and method of operation that 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 did us well in Apollo uh, I looked at him and I kind of frowned and he could tell that I didn't understand what it was but i immediately turned to the to the uh, capcom who was a fellow named jerry carr an astronaut and i said capcom have him try sce to aux well jerry turned around and looked at me with that same uh, uh puzzled look but he keyed his microphone and said uh apollo 13 try, try sce to aux now we didn't hear it but it was on the voice recorder on board later on Pete Conrad said what the hell is that and um, so he didn't know either but luckily Al Bean did where that switch was it was right in front of him and he reached down and took it from the normal position to the auxiliary position and what happened we got our data back and um, so we then went through the process of trying to kind of find out where we were. I was watching the trajectory the whole time. We were right on the money, 
uh, trajectory wise because the Saturn V guidance system was actually the primary system for launch and the lightning didn't get it. It, it only got the spacecraft. So we got, finally got to orbit and, and uh, everything turned out okay. Now the lesson in all of that was the trust that I had of John and that of Jerry Carr, the Capcom had of me and the crew had of us on the ground. And that, that trust was built in a lot of ways. It was, uh, for one thing, we trained just hours and hours and hours of failures like this. We had never seen this one, but we, we swallowed the panic and got the job done. And that comes through training. And then the leadership side of this is the fact that we trusted people to make decisions and we made them at the right level. John Aaron was the best guy to answer that, not me. Uh, Jerry Carr depended on John. I depended on Jerry. That train of thought and that leadership capability, uh, I think uh, reflective of, of the entire NASA program uh, in those years. And I'll say that Apollo, I think, uh, due to, and I'm going to talk a little more about this on some other topics, but the leadership that we had from the top down uh, started at the White House uh, with the president. We had three of them during Apollo, two Democrats and a Republican, never wavered. Even when we had troubles, mm -hmm. their support was there. Uh, the Congress supported us. So throughout, and the public, the public was with us as well. I just want to lay that groundwork for some later thoughts because mm -hmm. Apollo 12 was a good example, uh, I thought, of, uh, of that chain of command and how it worked. And uh, sure enough, we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, when we decided uh, what to do uh, about going on to the moon. Now, uh, Sandy, I'll talk to you for a minute, but uh, and I hope I made that clear enough what I'm trying to lay the uh, groundwork for. It's crystal clear and thank you. I mean, thank you so much for sharing the story and how you approached collaborating in that moment. And I wanted to ask you about how that environment was set up. I know, you know, you've previously talked about, you know, the leadership in not only NASA headquarters and, you know, all the way up to the White House, being very collaborative, but then also the mission control environment and your colleague, Chris Kraft, who was instrumental in setting up the mission control environment and how I think, I think he said something like, if you, if you see something or something comes up, I want to know about it. Could you talk about that, um, that mandate and that understanding and then maybe how that um, led to this very quick level, there's a very deep level of trust in this really critical moment during, during this lightning strike on Apollo 12. Yes, what you're talking about there, Sandy, is it was prevalent throughout all of NASA, but particularly under Chris Kraft, who, what he said was, he said, I don't care whether you're a GS-7 or a GS-16, if you see something you think it's not right, speak up. You're not going to get in trouble for it. So we were all very open and, and, and when we made a mistake, which we did quite often in simulations, uh, you always fessed up. I made the wrong call. I, I didn't do that right. But what, what the agency was really trying to do, and it, 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 when you think about it, uh, we were all young. Uh, I was one of the oldest guys in the control center. Let's see, at this time I was probably 35. Uh, but I had spent four years in the Air Force and, and about a year in the private sector before I got there. We had guys like John Aaron. I think he was at that time mid-20s. So we had a lot of people that were doing a task that had never been done before. So it was kind of easy to, in a way, to kind of, let's figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And with leaders like Chris, who said, everybody is a part of this uh, program and so you've got to, we've got to all pitch in um, and we did and it was funny how 
the decisions in NASA at that point were always pushed down to the lowest level where the expertise uh, really uh, resided. And we didn't try to make too many decisions up at the top that should have been made at the bottom. Now, I contend any organization that ages, and it could be a corporation, it could be not-for-profit, it could be anything. Over time, what happens is decisions start to get pulled up higher and higher to, a, to an altitude <laughs> where uh, the air gets thin. And today, uh, I see decisions being made inside the Beltway of Washington that should be made, made at a branch level uh, or a, a section level at one of the space centers. And it's, it's not uncommon. You've got to fight that, that tendency to pull decisions up higher. So Chris really instilled that in us in mission control. And I think it still exists because I get down there uh, enough that I can tell that it still has that, that ring to it inside the control center. Although they're flying ISS right now and at the International Space Station, and it's not as dynamic as a Saturn launch, but uh, they still have to make decisions. And I, I can tell that, that that attitude is still there. I hope we can maintain that uh, as we go back to the moon the next time and, uh, and keep that going. But I, uh, during Apollo 12, let me give you, give you an example. We got into orbit uh, and everything looked okay. So then we did a quick check and it, by the way, uh, John Aaron was the guy that really uh, directed this. Uh, we did a query the electrical system. We could find nothing wrong. Uh, we also uh, did a quick check of the, of the engine in the back that had to make the maneuvers to get us in and out of orbit uh, at the moon. Um, we couldn't find anything wrong in there. So now the decision is, we've been hit by lightning. Do we go to the moon or do we come home? because mm -hmm. we don't know what we may have fried in the rear end. So I think there's a picture mm -hmm. of uh, Chris Craft sat behind me uh, at, that, at a console right up above the flight director console. Uh, Chris came down and this was the moment where he said, uh, he said, Jerry said, we do not have to go to the moon today. It's your call. And he turned around and went, and I said something like, okay. And he turned around, and went back to his console. What he was telling me is that nobody above the flight director was gonna to try to make the decision here. It was the flight director and his team that was gonna make that decision. And of course I had a lot of help. Story ended up, we said, let's go to the moon. So we did. And you know, after that, that was one of the cleanest missions we ever had almost no problems. Uh, we lost a TV camera on the surface of the moon, but, <laughs> but other than that, yeah. <laughs> uh, that mission was clean as a bell. So mm -hmm. we made the right decision. I guess we could have been wrong, but we weren't. And, uh, but the neat part of this was, as you can see in the picture, Kraft stepped down to my console and just said, it's your call, uh, essentially. And so it turned out to be uh, a good, and I felt really good about it after it worked. Uh, it, we were still a little bit worried about what the lightning might have done back in the mm -hmm. back to the heat shield or, or something else, but we'd already uh, bought into that. And uh, so this is a good example of, of, I thought, leadership at its finest. One, let me say one other thing about that. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things I th think about leadership that is so important is that Kraft was a leader. And, and I can tell that because all of us wanted him to succeed and all of him, we wanted him to look good in doing it. That's because we respected him and he respected us. And that was true up and down the organization. So it, mm -hmm. was a, it was a really interesting time for me and it taught me a lot about what it takes to get difficult tasks done. 
Well, yeah, and when you're, and thank you so much for sharing those stories. I mean, there's there's a couple of things there. I think that uh, so much of it rings true, but when we're talking about <clears throat> unpacking some of those key principles and how folks can apply these lessons to their day-to-day -day lives. I think anybody would wanna work in an environment like this where you're really wired to make the other person look good. You're wired to get people's backs. So there's a common, common phrase when you're improvising and going out you know, on stage and performing without a script. There's a moment backstage where everybody says, I got your back, I got your back, I got your back. And it's, it's kind of a nice um, brief ritual or moment where everybody reminds each other no matter what happens, we are fully supporting each other and we're fully trusting each other. And I would think that in this environment, you know, with, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say that, that interesting during that time, and I still do it, I can't, I can't break the habit. Mm -hmm. We almost, and I said we, almost lost the personal pronoun I. We seldom said I. It was always we. That was the teamwork aspect. And as a matter of fact, even today, when I talk about something we did on Apollo 15 at the moon, I said, we did this. Well, I didn't do it. The crew was actually on the surface doing something. But I always refer to it as we were doing this and we were doing that. And we lost that I. Uh, it's sometimes you'd hear, I think. Mm -hmm. But you never said I did or I want to do. It's we did or we wanted to do it or we tried it. So, so I think that's a, a good example of teamwork is where you kind of drop that. When you said, I've got your back, uh, remind me of that because we, we had each other's back and we didn't care who got the credit. Uh, it was a we uh, thing. Yeah. And yeah. it still is. I still think of it that way. It's, it still is. I think it's still prevalent today. I do hear people talk about missions and missions and endeavors they're supporting versus saying, you know, hey, I'm Sandy and this is what I do. Hi, my name is Sandy and this is who I'm supporting. This is the endeavor I'm supporting. This is the mission I'm supporting. And taking that I and replacing it with we, I think is a real critical piece of this ensemble environment you're talking about, about this collaboration piece. It also gets back to, I think like, you know, a fundamental principle of improv is this phrase, yes, and, which a lot of people are familiar with, but it's really all about putting your own agenda aside and taking in new information and validating it and building on it to solve a problem, right? So you can't, if you're getting new information, you can't control that. So you can't control the fact that lightning strikes the Saturn V, which is something that is totally beyond our comprehension. But in that moment, you get this piece of information from John Aaron in this environment that you and Chris Kraft and everyone set up that says, if you see something, raise your hand. And you're like, well, that's the deal. Let's let's tell them SCE to Ox. Like that is a got your that's back, good. trusting, collaborative environment. It's There's a number of takeaways. But I think what you raise about the right. I versus we and not saying I as much to push an agenda or push an opinion is really critical. Um, I want to get to that notion um, on the next mission that we're going to talk about, which is uh, another very famous mission, Apollo 13. So as many folks know, Apollo 13 launched on April 13th, 1970, and it was aborted after an oxygen tank ruptured on the way to the moon. So three astronauts were on board and they all came home. So this mission was later classified by NASA as a successful failure because of the experience gained in rescuing the crew and working together as a team. And it's become a quick case study uh, of thinking on your feet, agility, and solving problems. So Jerry, I can imagine that being part of this mission involved bringing various points of view and opinions to solve these problems. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about this mission, how you worked behind the scenes to pivot deal with the situation and kind of align on a plan in the moment to to bring the astronauts home and get things done yeah 13 was uh <laughs> that was a, a real test for us the uh, we had never simulated a failure that would require to use the lunar module as a lifeboat, which is what we ended up doing. 
uh, we had talked about it a bit. Uh, he said, you know, you could probably get a lot out of that lunar module if you still had it with you. And thank goodness where the oxygen tank exploded, we were roughly 200,000 miles from Earth and about 40,000 miles to go to the moon. Uh, it happened almost at a perfect place because we had all of the lunar module uh, still with us. Nothing had taken off to go land. Uh, we had uh, all of its consumables, uh, its, its oxygen, its water, its power, uh, etc. So it, it was very fortuitous that we had that uh, explosion where we had it. Um, after it took probably two hours to get the thing kind of settled down to know what uh, Gene Kranz's uh, white team was on duty. In fact, as a matter of fact, I had re he had relieved me and I have, was out playing a softball game. Um, mm. and, and they came out and got me and said, you need to come back to the control center. So when I first walked back into the control center, I still had on my, and, uh, my mm. hat and I was, uh, uh, and I could tell when I walked in that it was uh, serious because it was quiet, it was disciplined. By the way, when I worked on the movie, I tried to get Ron to calm all that down. He always wanted people moving around. I said, it wasn't that way. I said, it was mm. calm. And mm. there were more people in the room. <laughs> he, he, he said, I'm not making a documentary. I'm trying to make a, <laughs> an entertaining film. Yeah. And uh, if he told me that once, he told me that a hundred times. But anyhow, the, the, uh, I walked back in and I could tell things were were grim because there was no smiling going on at all. And uh, it took me about 30 or 40 minutes to figure out exactly what they were doing. I plugged in to a, to a console so I could listen. And then when we got everything kind of calmed down, we knew that we had a, a several day trip home. In fact, I, I went home, tried to get some sleep. It didn't work because uh, I knew I had to come back in. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Anyway, I finally got out and came back in. The, uh, the interesting thing about 13 was that nothing was gonna happen in a hurry, uh, but we knew that we were gonna be short on consumables. So we had, for the next two days, 18 hours to 24 hours, uh, we really worked on what are we gonna do? We got back on a, what we call a free return. We were off the free return for lighting purposes. But the free return meant that if you didn't do anything, you'd just go around the moon, its gravity would loop you back to the earth and you would land wherever, it might be in China or wherever, hopefully on the water is what we would hope. But at least you would get back to earth. Um, that wasn't good enough. There were several options we had to look at, pr three primary options, and I won't go to it for reasons of time, but there was, there was a couple that were just too much propulsion required to do it, we thought. Glenn Lunny and I, uh, our two teams, it just because of the timing, did most of the planning at looking at these options and how could we get home? And one of the options was something we call PC plus two, which is parasynthian, which you can just, that's the point of closest approach to the moon, plus mm -hmm. two hours. If we could burn that, lunar module engine for a long time we could speed up the return get home at almost a day earlier and we could put them back in the pacific to a known landing point so that we had recovery forces that we could get uh, to help them um, but we had these other options and so when it came down time to to decide uh, what we were going to do and, and really put it in concrete Glenn and I talked and, and decided that this has got to go to NASA management because this could literally be the, the saving of Apollo 13 or maybe it's demise, we didn't know. But so we went off to a separate room out of the control center, uh, in the control center building. In fact, it was, if you look on the left of this picture, there's a uh, uh, viewing room there. We went to the other floor viewing room where nobody was abandoned hmm. at that time. It was quiet. 
and Glenn and I, these two young guys, I was 35, he was 33. We were looking in the leadership of NASA. We were looking into the, to the eyes of Tom Payne, who was the administrator, the head of the agency. And we had Jim McDivitt, the program manager at, at JSC. And we also had the program director from headquarters, Rocco Patron. Some of you may remember that name. Uh, we had Bob Gilruth. Uh, we had Chris Kraft. We had Deke Slayton. Uh, and I never can remember whether Von Brown was there or not. I'm not sure. We, there were some other people there. So we briefed them on these three options. And we said, it is our opinion that probably the PC plus two is the best. It gets us home faster. Uh, we'll get back to a place where a good place. And, and so we stopped at that point. And I, I can remember thinking to myself, well, we'll get questions now. Did you think about this? Did you do that? What about this? Why didn't you do this? There was a long, awkward silence. And then the head of the agency, uh, Tom Payne, said, what can we do for you men? That's all he said. And hmm. we kind of looked and grinned and we saluted and said, we think we got it, sir. And we went back down to the uh, to the floor and uh, got on the on the uh, plan then and if my team was on duty I can remember walking back in there and saying okay gang we got a plan it's PC plus two but it was a show again of here's all of these talented people high level that could, could have been full of ideas and full of questions and all that mm -hmm. they trusted us and we trusted them and they gave it to us. As Glenn Lenny said uh, uh, about the whole Apollo program is a little bit like being a teenager and giving the keys to the car and say, take it to the moon. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't second guess us. So there is another example of the leadership coming that said, said we trust you. You're, we know you're prepared. You guys are at the right level to make the decision. Uh, what can we do to help you? And uh, I thought it was, it was a pivotal moment uh, for me. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was, it was just incredible to have that kind of trust uh, put in you when you're 35 years old. And uh, mm -hmm. so it was cool. It was really a, a neat time. Well, it's, it's inspirational to hear of that level of trust. And I think if you're working for someone who, who says that, you know, what can we do to help you men in this, in this environment that you're working in when you, there's so much pressure on a quick decision and managing this, this amount of risk that you're talking about, you're saying, you know, this PC plus two solution, this might be the solution or it might be the demise. It could be either one. And they're looking at you going, yeah. we trust you. We, we have your back and we trust that you're working to manage the risk probably as close to zero as possible and that this is the, the best solution. And if you're close to the decision, we've set up this environment where, hey, hey Jerry and Glenn, you're closest to the decision. So we're going with your plan. Do you, did you feel um, in that, in that moment that the simulation and training um, in the Apollo era was also helpful? I mean, you've spoken earlier in this conversation about just the importance of training and simulation. And I'm wondering, we talked about a couple of these case studies Absolutely. about lightning striking and, and you know, this, this two tank explosion. Um, how does this training and simulation play into this problem solving to manage risk? You know, the, um, one of the interesting things about Apollo is how, except for the break after this oxygen tank, we had about a 10 month break before we flew 14. And after the fire, we had about a almost two year break before we flew again. But most of the flights were coming one after a, other, another, uh, roughly six months apart, give or take. And as soon as we would land one mission, we except for the astronauts, which I always gave them a hard time. They'd go off on a world tour 
and uh, have fun. And those of us in mission control just turn around, and start getting ready for the next flight. And we would turn around uh, and immediately start training uh, for the next flight. One of the things that's always amazed me about Apollo is that we had, this was 1960s, early 1970s, the fidelity of the simulations that we could run were incredible. Uh, we would have the crew in a simulator, the astronauts. We would be in the control center. They were wired together. Uh, and, and this was, it wasn't microwave or anything. These were hard wires. But to, to us in the control center, it looked like a real mission. And, and when you, this in between us, we had these guys called simulation supervisors. They could throw in problems and test us. And they would give us a problem, we'd solve it. They'd give us another one, we'd solve it. They'd give us two in a row or two in, together. We would solve those two. They could bring us to our knees eventually where we absolutely just could not deal with it all. But what that did for us, it was a little bit like training for a marathon mm. and putting on combat boots and running on the beach. And then when you got to the real marathon, put on tennis shoes and run on a hard surface, it, in many, except for Apollo 13, every mission we flew was easier than the simulations. The simulations were hard, and it, but it toughened us and it, it got our skills on the ground where we could we could handle virtually anything which is what we did on 13 the whole thing came into action now there's another point here 13 this is where you really get to we instead of i or even us uh, apollo 13 you get a lot of you get a lot of uh, impression that it between the crew and the mission control we did that that's not true we were the tip of the iceberg. We had every contractor that made anything on that spacecraft active. They, we had simulations run on equipment that we didn't have at JSC, at Johnson Space Center. We would have a simulation run at, at Bethpage where they built the lunar module or at Downey, California where they built the command module. Or we would have software reworks done at Draper Lab at MIT. Uh, we had the whole country uh, capability, Apollo, pulled together. And we had guys in our back rooms and we had mission planners and all of that that all came to task. It just so happened that it all came together in mission control and it got transmitted mm -hmm. up. But we didn't do all this on our own. And that and that's one of the the things that I think uh, kind of gets kind of gets lost. That it, it was when I say a we team, it was huge. It was all over the U.S. And so I the trade between the training and the and the capability that we had, it allowed us to pull the fat out of the fire on Apollo 13 because we had been trained. Don't ever give up. As long as you've got options, keep going. And that's exactly what we did. And we never ran out of options. We got close. We were, it turned out the closest consumable we had. We thought it was all gonna be oxygen or power. Turned out it was water. We were, we were down to about less than 20 hours of water left. And we had them rationed. We had the crew drinking only about six ounces a day. They came back extremely dehydrated. Mm. And uh, but we weren't producing water from fuel cells. So uh, my point is, we got through all of that by being trained well enough mm -hmm. uh, not to panic. We training taught you how to swallow panic uh, and get to the task and mm -hmm. and use your best judgment. So it's a very interesting lesson for I, I think uh, the role of training. It's such an applicable lesson, and that idea of um, training enough so that you, you know, as you said, swallow the panic. But then also, when you're talking about the the I versus we mentality, and really focusing on the team, you can probably shift that, you know, unknown energy to what can I do to make this other person look good? What can I do to help the team, right? And if you're if you're just shifting yep. the focus a little bit yep. to solving the problem. 
that actually takes that panic energy away, right? And you're putting that same amount of energy into yeah. Yeah. being a part of the ensemble and the team, which is something I think, you know, you're, you're saying loud and clear in a number of these stories, which a lot of people viewing today can take away. Um, I want to uh, transition to uh, the audience in a second um, to take some questions, because I know Mimi and Michelle and Jim and the great folks at the Cosmosphere uh, are collecting a number of the questions for you um, in the chat box. I did want to ask you one quick question. We were, we were on a call a couple days ago um, going through these slides, and you mentioned this photo here, and you told a really cool story about the ring that you're wearing in this in this photo. I was wondering if you could share that with everybody real quick before we um, transition back sure. to the cause. Yeah. If you, this photo, which is kind of an iconic uh, Apollo 13 photo, and I, I get it all the time from people to sign and all that, but I, uh, I didn't even know this photo had been taken. Uh, the guy that took the stills in the control center was so unobtrusive, we never saw him. <laughs> and, uh, but it was just a natural reaction. This was the moment that the crew stepped out on the deck of the carrier. Uh, we waited until that moment before we celebrated because just because they splashed down in the water didn't mean they were safe yet because they could drown or the capsule could, the spacecraft could sink or whatever. So we waited until that moment when they stepped on the deck of the carrier and we figured that was solid enough to say good. Um, and then we all had these cigars that I had one in my mouth. I hated cigars, but it was tradition. So we had, I had in my left hand, there is some matches and I lit that cigar right afterwards. But I put my thumb up in the air and it's just natural. Uh, it's a, those of you that are from Texas know that the Texas Longhorns use the hook of horn sign and the Texas Aggies have the, we call it gigum sign. Mm -hmm. And I guess it just came out naturally. Well, if you blew my hand up, you'll see a, a class ring, uh, my Texas A&M uh, class ring. Uh, we call it a senior ring. And uh, in fact, I've got one on my hand here, but mm -hmm. it's not that, but it's not that one. Mm -hmm. um, that one flew to the moon on Apollo 12. Uh, I asked Pete Conrad if he would take my A&M ring and take it to, uh, uh, to the moon. And he said, sure, uh, give it to me. They had something called a personal preference kit on board that they could put their stuff into that for their families and that kind of thing is very I think it was limited to five or ten pounds it wasn't much but I gave it to him and then when it came back I got it back and I put it on so that ring uh, had flown on the prior mission to the moon and I still had it on it wasn't too long after that till I took it off and said you know that's not too uh, smart I had all the documentation that verified it was going to the they had been to the moon so I took it off and put it in a safety deposit box. And uh, well, long story short, and my wife got me another ring uh, mm -hmm. to replace it. Uh, I, I didn't know what to do with the ring. So I finally contacted Texas A&M and I said, I'd like to donate the ring to the university. And um, they said, outstanding, sure. you know. And they were building a new engineering building that uh, 500,000 square feet, and it's, it's huge. It is beautiful too. They said, we wanna put that at the entrance to the engineering building. And uh, so that's where it is. It's on display uh, at the university. And they picked up, because I, they caught me in an interview where I said, you know, when I got this ring, I didn't know where it was going to take me. I had no idea. There was no space program or anything like that. Well, they picked up on that theme of where is your Aggie ring going to take you? So that signage is kind of all over the engineering building. Uh, mm. Where will your Aggie ring take you? And uh, so it was a great end to this, uh, this story of the ring. Uh, and uh, and I, every time I go over there, uh, I kind of have to go by and look at it and make sure it's still okay. And it is, it's under glass and it explains the whole story. Uh, 
But anyway, that's a, that's a long answer to your question, uh, Sandy. But but it's a it's a good story. It's a fantastic story. I, I think everybody watching, me included, is trying to play it kind of cool hearing that story. But it's I mean it's amazing that this this ring flew to the moon, but then you're you're wearing it and thought, well. I should probably do something with this incredible yeah. artifact that actually went to the moon. And then it goes to a safety deposit box. And then back to your alma mater, which yeah. is so representative of education, training, preparation, yeah. what we're talking about, about preparing for anything, preparing for the unexpected, especially when you're you know, working as a leader. So thanks so much for sharing that. It's, it's an incredible story. And I want to throw it back to the great cosmosphere. Speaking of education, and the premier uh, science institution and museum, Great Cosmosphere. Mimi, hello. I'm gonna hello. stop sharing my screen. And what an honor to be a part of this conversation with the great Jerry Griffin. And I hear you've, you've got uh, quite a number of questions that are coming through on the chat box. So we're excited to throw it to you to hear what, what folks wanna ask Jerry. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you, Jerry. I could truly listen to both of you visit all day long. I only wish that you were here with us. We have viewers tuning in today, literally from coast to coast and around the world. And I think each of them has to have been impacted just as much as those of us here, as we've been hearing these stories, but not just the history, it's about how it all relates to what we can do today and how we can be our best in any moment we have, where likely for most of us, we don't have three lives depending on our decisions. But we do have nine states represented, um, United Kingdom, Germany, so thank you to all of you who've tuned in and they have some great questions. First, one uh, literary question, what are some of your favorite books to read on the history of mission control? So um, that one's for you, Jerry. Well, I think there, there are two books that are really good. One is, is uh, Chris Kraft's book, which is Flight, um, My Life in Mission Control. And it really does start at Mercury and uh, it goes even before Mercury, but, uh, you know, through the shuttle era and what happened, how mission control developed and how it got started and how it developed. Uh, excellent book. Um, also, Gene Kranz's book, uh, Failure is Not an Option. By the way, that was never said uh, in mission control. That was a, uh, that was the movie that created Failure is Not an Option. It never was uh, there's a story behind that, how it happened, but but uh, uh, that book is is really good. If someone wants to um, understand the uh, the really technical aspects of mission control, the buildings itself, the positions, how they did, Dutch von Ehrenfried, who was a flight controller, uh, has written a series of books, and I can't remember that it it made be called mission control, but it's von Ehrenfried. It's uh, is the author Dutch, and it is excellent. It is it really it takes scenes that that looks like uh, where Mimi is standing there, and it identifies each position and what they did and so forth. So in a lot of detail. So I would say those three books are the best if you want to really. Get Chris Kraft's book, get Gene Kranz's book, and get Dutch von Ehrenfried's book. Great. And then we had a follow up question, Jerry. Do you have plans to write a book? Yes. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. And uh, uh, I started it about probably 10 years ago, and I'm almost through chapter one. Um, <laughs> that's being a little facetious. I have not. You know, writing a book, you got to take some time, and I, I have never had it. I've never slowed down. I've never, I've never been out of doing something, and just like this today, and and some of it I have to. Before the pandemic, I was traveling all over the world, uh, and there's more plans to do some more of that, and I intend to keep doing that. So, I've had that question asked uh, about writing a book, and I need to do it. I, I've compiled a lot, and I've talked to a couple of, of people that would help me write it. One is at Texas A&M Press, 
and uh, and a, a writer there that is writes a lot of st stuff about famous Aggies and that kind of thing. But got the time, I just don't have it. Uh, I keep working for Mimi and uh, or, or somebody, <laughs> you know, somebody wants me to do something, so I go do it, and uh, and I love doing it. And by the way, a lot of you know there are people that were in Mission Control that don't like to do things like this because they're just not comfortable doing it. I've always felt kind of an obligation that that the American people were the stakeholders. They were the they were the stock owners. They owned the, they owned the enterprise that took us to the moon. And I think it's important that they hear about it if they want to hear about it. That uh, that's why I feel a certain obligation to keep telling the story because uh, we're not you know, all of us are getting fairly mature. I think is kind of the way I'd say it. Um, my wife just says you're getting old, but. Uh, you know, and uh, I really think uh, there's an obligation to keep telling this story as much as we can. So that's why I don't mind working for you, Mimi. Um. <laughs> Let me tell you, Jerry, we are so honored that you do. And I think it's not just that you're willing to do it. It's that you have a remarkable blend of experience and skills that makes the story so relevant to so many people and the style with which you tell it. So we're very grateful and you can hang out at the Cosmosphere anytime and we'll help you write the book, right, Candy? 100%. <laughs> I think the title of the book, the title should be called, Oh, By the Way, because it's all the Oh, By the Way moments. There's so much meat and potatoes. You have these amazing stories. And then in these conversations, there's a quick, oh, here's this one thing. And that's a whole nother whole yeah. thing. So it's just, I mean, they're fascinating to hear. Listen to and I've, right. I've, by the way, I have compiled, I keep putting, I, I did an outline of kind of what I would think a book ought to have. And then I keep throwing stuff into this file and I've got it categorized so that I know where to go get it. But I got to have some time uh, to stop and, and do it. And so tell the person, that, I would tell the person that asked the question, uh, stand by, it's in work. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get there one day. Perfect. Well, we're, we're all waiting with bated breath. And okay. I think it's hilarious that you just said, by the way, that's a great <laughs> title for the book, Sandy. So by the way, we have another question. Did you have a specific moment in time, Jerry, when you realized we'd get to the moon? Yeah, I, I did. I actually, I really thought on Apollo 8 when we orbited the moon that uh, there were several things happened for all, we didn't know it at the time for all intents and purposes uh, we found out later that uh, the space race with the soviets uh, was over they in around that same time had had some big problems with their booster big explosion and uh, that we didn't know about but but and we were you know we were pushing to to get this done and and uh, because we were in a race it was a cold war foreign policy issue i mean it just it was it was that plain um so yeah i uh on an eight when we were able to get to the moon and just orbit it i started to get a good feeling that you know we can do this i think we're going to be able to do this now we didn't have a lunar module with us on that flight and uh and the flight was fairly uneventful. Uh, there were some problems, but nothing that every every mission had problems, and they ranged from nagging to serious. I would put nagging uh, Apollo eight. Um, then when we did ten, Apollo ten was kind of a dress rehearsal. We couldn't have landed that lunar module anyway. I, some people ask, why didn't you go ahead and land on ten? Well, it was too heavy. That that version of the lunar module was too heavy. So we didn't ha have the capability, but we did get down close to the surface. At that point, I really thought we had it made. And so eight and 10, neither of which landed us on the moon, were very, very pivotal, I think, in saying we can do this. And of course, then we did follow it up with 11 and, and 
and it worked. Um, and uh, I can I can remember eleven uh, like it was yesterday. I know exactly where I was sitting in that room, and uh, it was uh, a big moment when when Neil touched down, uh, Neil and Buzz. Well, Jerry, I have a quick follow up question, um, and pardon me if is nagging a technical term, or do you mean <laughs> nagging like the <laughs> nagging between spouses? You know, it, it's it's a it's a technical term. Uh, uh, I guess some people's nagging problem would be pretty serious, but uh, we learned to live with the uh, nagging problems because we always were going to have them. And uh, you know, they, they, you think about it. This was 1960s technology, and uh, nowadays I look at the spacecraft uh, like like the uh, uh, Dragon that the SpaceX lies. I've been inside a mock-up of it. And I've been inside the mock-up of the Blue Origin. Uh, and, and the technology is so different. Everything is touch screen and, and, uh, and you can, of course you can, the, the young people that are watching this thing, of course, that they don't even know anything except touch screen. What, what do you mean you had switches and circuit breakers that you had to pull in and out and mechanical? devices and things like that. And, uh, but nowadays, uh, those cockpits are so clean, there's no, there's just not much there. And in our days, you know, there were wires all over the place and they had to hook up stuff and put it in the window so they could do something. And, and, uh, but it's amazing how well it worked. And uh, 50 years ago, and it worked uh, incredible. But yeah, nagging's a technical term. Okay, I'm I'm gonna remember that um, on the domestic front from now on. Okay. It's I'm a technical advisor in our household, and therefore yeah. nagging is a technical term. Okay. We have uh, another question. When you mentioned um, being part of Apollo 11, what was the most profound uh, part of that for you? I missed the first part of your question, Mimi. You, you mentioned you mentioned being part of Apollo Eleven, and of course, yeah. that's the, the when we did make it to the moon. And what was the most profound part of that mission for you? Well, it was it was the landing. There's no doubt that that, that the lunar landing on on Eleven was what it was all about. I'll tell you a quick story. It just came to mind. Oh, by the way, um, <laughs> very I was. Brand. I was assigned on the first shift uh, with Cliff Charlesworth, who was the lead flight director for Apollo 11. It wasn't, it wasn't Gene Kranz, he did the landing, but the lead flight director was a fellow named Cliff Charlesworth. And Cliff said, why don't you ride shotgun with me and, uh, and we'll see if we can kind of, maybe at certain points divvy up some tasks here, which we did later on as an official thing. It was kind of unofficial on 11. We're, I'm sitting next to Cliff during the countdown uh, of Apollo 11. Here's the first time to go land on the moon. And we had, in the countdown, we had what we call built-in holes. The holes were there so you could stop and everybody could take a look, just stop the countdown and stop the clock. And everybody could take a look, make sure, okay, everything's good here, good here, good here. Okay, now we can pick up the count. Those were called built-in holes. We had holes that were called for a problem, but these weren't problems. They were built-in holes. So we get down to a built-in hold. I think it was at T minus nine minutes. Uh, there was a big, there was a long hold at, at T minus nine. And I'm sitting there next to Charlie, and I had my headset, and I could hear all the chatter going on between the cave and all. And my mind went to Apollo 12, because I had already been designated to be the lead flight director for 12, and I'd already met with the crew, and I'd done some mission rules work and flight plan work. So I'm sitting here on this moment of history where we're going to go and land on the moon. And my mind wandered off, I, yeah, I got to go do this, and I need to talk to so-and-so about that. And we hadn't even launched at 11 yet. And all of a sudden, it kind of snapped. I said, get your head back in the game here. You know, you, you can't be thinking about 12. We hadn't even launched at 11 yet. 
And so uh, it, that's the way it was though, when you were going as fast as we were. Mm -hmm. And, but I got right back on 11. And to answer your question, the moment of landing, uh, the, the, the moment that still sends chills up my back is when I listen to a recording and I hear Buzz say, we're picking up some dust. And when he said that, I said, holy moly, our engine is blowing dust off the lunar surface and they're about to touch down. It still gives me goosebumps to think about it. And because nobody had ever said that before. Now later flights, they all said, picking up some dust or getting some dust now. But that was the first time any human being had ever said that they were blowing dust off of another place other than Earth. And uh, I knew they had it made about that time because they were getting down pretty low. They were less than 100 feet. And uh, so it was, that was the chilling moment for me on 11 was uh, picking up some dust. I told, I've told Buzz that story and he said, well, I figured it would be kind of neat to say or something like that. He gave me a good answer. Well, I think I, I hadn't thought of it in those terms before, and it just gave me chills as you told the story. And I want to um, point out two takeaways, Sandy, you probably heard them too. For those watching for leadership lessons, there were two there. First of all, a lead flight director who asked another flight director to ride shotgun, to share that leadership experience, to yep. come alongside. And he probably didn't do that just to train you up. He was probably doing it because he valued what you could share with him, which I think- He did. Is the hallmark of a great leader. In his background, uh, Cliff's background was, he was a Fido. He was down in that first row. He was a guy that handled trajectories. and. I was, my background was systems. So it was a nice, uh, he knew everything about uh, uh, trajectories that I didn't know. And I knew a lot about the systems that he didn't know. So it was a good, good deal. Now, later on, what we did, we actually put two flight directors on that first shift uh, because when we got to the moon, think of this, you separate the command module, it stays in orbit and the lunar module goes down and lands. So what we did early on, we had the flight director, a single guy saying grace over these two vehicles that were doing entirely different things, in orbits apart, you know, the command module kept orbiting. And uh, later on, we actually put another Capcom with a flight director just to handle that command module, uh, which was pretty calm. I mean, he, he was in Earth in lunar orbit, not doing a whole lot, but uh, maneuver wise. and so it it was uh it was kind of a precursor to that and uh but we found out that having two guys there on that first shift was was pretty good right and a great leadership decision on his part and then the yep. second thing i heard relates to another one of our questions which is today the vernacular would be staying present in the moment but you you at nine minutes from launch weren't in the moment you were in the future and that all of us do that. We, yep. we have a tendency to be distracted by the future, to be distracted by consultants or situations. Mm -hmm. And in mission control, you, you really couldn't do that. So you brought yourself back. And one of the questions was, how yep. do you do that? How do you stay focused? Well, I guess, you know, in, that, in this case, um, I knew the countdown was going to pick up pretty quickly. So it was going to wake me up or get me out of that pretty quick anyway. But I, I got to think about it. this is crazy. You know, we got to get 11 done before we even think about 12. So it was, it was fairly easy. And when you're about to launch a vehicle that produced seven and a half million pounds of thrust and you're lifting about six and a half million pounds, it, it's a moment that you can't, stay away from very long you know one thing we in the control center we didn't watch the launch on television because we didn't want the flight controllers to to get distracted looking at, at that we wanted everybody looking at and nobody minded it we just looked we figured we could watch a replay uh later of the uh 
of the launches, but it was a very focused time. And so we didn't want any distractions that, uh, that might uh, somebody looking at a picture rather than looking at their data. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I finally woke up, and got back. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad that you did. Um, this question, hello from the UK. I really appreciate Jerry's insights. Oh, I'm sorry. That was the one I already asked. Do you have any plans for a book? So that was for our friend in the United Kingdom. Um, did the military background of young NASA contribute to an early common leadership and risk environment? More importantly, how do you take your coffee? Because we're sure you didn't get much sleep on Apollo 13. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the um, uh, military background, uh, in my case, I know was helpful for, for a number of reasons. And of the flight directors, Milt Wendler was a former Air Force pilot. Uh, uh, Gene Kranz was a military pilot. Pete Frank. Uh, who is no longer with us, was a Navy jet pilot. I was a backseater in F-101s, a supersonic jet. Um, Lunny and Charles Worth, and that's the six guys that we did Apollo with, uh, didn't have military experience. But I think it was, it was helpful. We had a lot of military, former military, uh, and even current military people that helped us get started. Uh, and we had personnel that were actually in the control center that were for, that were military. They just didn't wear a uniform. They had a badge that looked like us. Um, it helped me from a number of areas. One is just the discipline of, of you know, when you're flying in a high performance airplane, you got to know what you're doing. You, get, you use a checklist and, and, and uh, it's, it's a time that you don't want to be fiddling around it, you really get the discipline of what you're trying to do with this complex machine so that the discipline helped there was another thing about military and this is sometimes it probably is misunderstood if i when i say it um there's a risk involved it, it's it's a high risk i spoke about the seven and a half million pounds of thrust and pushing up on six and a half million pounds of high explosive propellant there's a risk and, and you try to manage it as low as you can, but you can never manage it to zero. It's impossible. Now I know zero defects and programs like that you try, but it's, it's a risky, it's, there's an inherent risk in spaceflight just like in aviation that is never gonna go completely away. You do the best you can. Um, I had experience in the military in a fighter squadron where we lost people that crashed and, and didn't make it. Um, you build up a scar tissue, that's what I call it, kind of a scar tissue. It's, it's not that you get hardened, it's that you, you've got to go on. You, got to, you accept it and go on. And I had, I think I knew, for instance, at the Apollo 1 fire, we had a lot of really young people uh, in the control center. And it affected them extremely hard. And it affected me too. They were three good friends. But I think my background uh, taught me that uh, it builds up a little scar tissue that says, it's okay. We know we got to fix it. We got to find out what happened, fix it. And we got to press on. And um, so that was helpful for me. I don't mean that as a, as a heavy thing because I didn't think about it much, but when it came to, it, I said, you know, I've been here before. Uh, and I've been here before where you lost, I got a good, good picture of a guy that has uh, already got his G suit on. He was gonna go fly. We watched a, a flight demonstration sitting on top of the ops building at Hamilton Air Force Base. It was probably 1958, 59. And I took his picture uh, and 45 minutes later, he was dead. Um, and he had crashed in San Pablo Bay, uh, right there by San Francisco and didn't make it. And I, you know, I'm kind of a, whoa. Um, 
but those kind of experiences when you're in a high risk environment, I think uh, you don't, you never get used to it, but you can figure out how to work through it. And uh, I think if any, if I got anything that out of the military that the discipline and a little bit of scar tissue uh, were the two things I'd say. Well, and both served you very well. And one thing you mentioned about all of the teams all across the nation who worked to solve the, the problem for Apollo 13, they were all working remotely. Well, today, so many of our teams are working remotely. And what advice do you have from a communication perspective or whatever you can offer for those who might even be at home watching right now who are also at work, yet they're working remotely? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think one thing this pandemic has, it's, I'm not sure we're going to get this genie back in the box that, that we're using right now. It's a very powerful tool. There are things we can do that uh, relatively low cost and, and efficient. Now there's some things you can't do. I, I think you've got to have in-person training, education, those kind of things where, where somebody's trying to tell you how to do something. I think you need that interface with, with people. Some things you can do virtually that you know, if it's just a mechanical connection or something, they want to show you how to do it. But I'm talking about really digging in and understanding. And, you know, if I had a, I think it's easy to kind of drift off and lose focus when you're virtual, if you're trying to listen to something that is, uh, let me say, not, not a whole lot of entertainment involved in it and that kind of thing. But I, I think we've, we've learned something that we can do this. Uh, and I, I don't know, I don't, I want to come back to the cosmosphere uh, physically. I don't want to have to do this all the time, but, but I think there may be times like this where it would be perfect. Do it, do it uh, virtually. And, um, and I like the idea, of, I have to kind of tear up my office here to get where I need to be. Uh, We've got a guest cabin out here, and I'm tempted to make a studio out of it so I can just walk into it <laughs> and be ready. If I had high-speed Wi-Fi out there, I'd do that. Right now, I don't have it out there, but but uh, I think I think we're I think you're gonna we're gonna see some things out of this that uh, they're gonna be helpful for training and learning. Uh, but we got to get the kids back in school, and we got to get the uh, college kids back in school, I think, and uh, it, it, there's, it's missing something on that because all of us know that part of education is interaction with people and how you how you deal with people and that kind of thing. So, um, and I the remote things that we did and in, in get to the question a little more right on, um, they were you know all we had was we had telephone and. Uh, you know, when, when we, our connection to the remote sites that did the tracking was by teletype. And I can remember when I first got in to the Gemini program or the Gemini program, um, it was 60 words, um, 60 word per minute teletype. And I can remember when we, it, it got upgraded to 100, to 100 words. Uh, yeah. And we thought we thought we died gone to heaven because we had all this high speed data. It was really something and it out of a printer. <laughs> and uh, and nowadays we of course we give zap, you know, and we can zap megabits in a hurry. And uh, so it, it, it was a big difference. And but those guys at those plants did those things and we we talk about it on the telephone. And mm -hmm. uh, and they would uh, I can't remember whether we may have had facts come in there right toward the end. I can't remember, but mm. but uh, that was really high speed once we got to that. Right. And there, there's a communication piece that so many people can learn from the environment that you guys set up because if we're all in these Zoom meetings and you really see boxes of faces and you're looking to collaborate or solve a problem, 
sometimes people don't know when their message has been heard, right? Yeah. And yeah. it's easy to tune out. And so, you know, simple tactics that you set up, like copy that or, you know, that e-com to flight, go flight, things like that. Like um, tell them SCE to OX. Great. I'll tell them that. Small tactical right. moments like that when people are, are giving you information then saying something as simple as like, thank you, or that's a great point, or just to build yeah. on that. So you're like, okay, these people have heard me. I think your, your environment at Mission Control is a real model for what people could take away when they're they're working in this virtual environment, especially around that communication piece. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's true in mission control, it's true in air traffic control, uh, where they're handling multiple airplanes and they can't see each other, but they know where each other are by data and that sort of thing. And then short communication that ties it all together. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I think from a, a leadership perspective, it's important to remember, and a teammate perspective, it's important to remember that everyone wants to know they were understood. And yep. so to Sandy's mm -hmm. point, that affirmation that you haven't just been heard, but that you've been understood is critical to moving a team along as efficiently and, and effectively as possible. Yeah. And speaking of which, I've heard more questions and I wanna let our audience know, we're gonna keep going. Generally, these are an hour, we're just gonna keep visiting because this is golden and we're having a great time. So stick with us, call your friends and tell them to jump on because there's more good stuff to come. So first of all, we have, you mentioned students, Jerry, and how they learn. We have a student with us today um, who says, this is so inspiring for me as I'm hoping to study aerospace engineering. What inspired Jerry to go into aerospace engineering and to work for NASA? Well, when I was about 10, my older brother, uh, who is no longer with us, was a uh, B-17 pilot. Uh, he didn't make it into combat in World War II, but he was, uh, he was a pilot. And that had a, a great effect on me and my twin brother that, that we thought Ken was bigger than, he was about five, nine and a half, but I thought he was about six foot five. And uh, we really looked up to him. And he, um, that, when he went into the Air Force or the Army Air Corps it was then and started flying, uh, it immediately turned both of uh, my twin brother and my, it turned us both on uh, immediately. Uh, in those days, there was no aerospace curriculum. There was an aeronautical uh, curriculum and that uh, I went to Texas A&M and majored in aeronautical engineering. When I went to work for, for, I got out of the Air Force and went to work for Lockheed for a short time there in Sunnyvale flying the, some of the first early spy satellites that the country tried. And we put a number of them into the Pacific Ocean, but that, that's another story. Um, I didn't know what an orbit was. I didn't know what, how do you put something in orbit and, and make it stay there? So I had to learn that uh, OJT on the job training. Uh, and how do you affect an orbit and how do you move it and in both in plane and altitude and all that, how do you do that? Well, nowadays, of course, you've got aerospace curriculum that has flight dynamics as part of it and how you do all that. And we were lucky that we had some astronomers in our crowd. We also had some physicists majored. In fact, John Aaron was a physics major. Um, they knew a little more about orbital mechanics and particularly the astronomers, you know, how the stuff moves around that, well, they could explain how you do things to us. So they, they were a big help, um, but it was, a, it was an interesting time. But what inspired me was the aviation piece of it. That's why I went into the Air Force. That's why I went, got into, I wanted, as soon as NASA was formed, I was in a fighter squadron in 1958 when it was formed. I said, that's where I want to go. If they're going, if they're going to try to go to the moon, I want to be a part of that. And, uh, and uh, so, but it all started with aviation for me. That's what got me going. 
well, and today, you know, Artemis, we're heading back. So I hope that a lot of um, young people are inspired to, to be part of that return to the moon. And um, we have a message from Steve Carruthers, who says, I was a space shuttle flight controller for 15 years. Thanks mm -hmm. for laying a great foundation for me. Great leadership lessons. Well, thanks, Steve. Uh, uh, you guys uh, took it to another level in many ways in shuttle. 135 missions, uh, pretty incredible and reusable orbiter and and all of that. That uh, I was uh, uh, shuttle was an amazing machine. Uh, I wish it could have gone on longer. Uh, a little bit expensive to operate, but but uh, it we learned a lot. The, the nation learned a lot about uh, space travel. Correct. You know. Sandy flew on a shuttle. That's that's right. The, at the Cosmosphere, the Falcon shuttle simulator. That's oh, exactly right. right. Back in the Cosmosphere. Did you crash? Uh, we didn't crash. We made it. We, we made it in the end. <laughs> Thank goodness. We saw, I, it. We saw I, it all the way through. That's right. <laughs> I heard from another um, former camper this week via letter, an 89 year old gentleman who was involved in the space industry for years. and. His family had given him um, the gift of coming to Cosmosphere Camp as an adult, and we still have those available, family camps, intergenerational opportunities. But he, he remembered every single thing he did as part of that camp experience. He said it was just amazing, but he did crash. So it happens, but the, the risks can be mitigated more easily in simulators. And today, Jerry, I want to be sure our audience knows our simulator is much like the ones you got to sit in. Um, we have um, our new um, simulator is built based on the Orion capsule and our missions include a gateway and more lunar landings. So I encourage everybody to take a look at our camp opportunities at Cosmo Camps and because you can do a lot of great learning right here at the Cosmosphere through our education program. But enough about the Cosmosphere, back to questions. So Jerry, you mentioned a few of the movies you've been involved and the other day you were showing us the chairs. Can you just kind of pan sure. the sure. director's chairs behind you and tell us a little bit, the question specifically is, did you have an enjoyable experience working on the movie Contact? Each chair represents a different movie you've been engaged in. Yeah, the, um, the first one, there that you see is is uh, over my left shoulder, I guess it is, um, is Apollo 13. And of course, that that's where I, I it's the first time I'd ever been involved in a movie. Um, and I can re remember um, we had the reason that I was called is that we had a meeting in Houston that that Ron Howard had set up or I guess people had set up. And there were about a half a dozen of us that had worked on 13 that he invited. We stood around the flight director console right behind me, me there um, and talked. We were supposed to talk for two hours. We ended up talking for four hours. And then we went to a local watering hole and uh, talked for another four hours. So we ended up talking for eight hours that day. And Jim Lovell was there. Uh, Kranz was there, Kraft was there, uh, uh, Jerry Bostick was there, I remember that. Anyhow, anyhow long story short, uh, that's a long story, but the, uh, we, we talked, he was trying to find, Ron was trying to find out, is there any emotion in this, in this mission? And, and he said, I've listened to the voice tapes and it sounds like everything's kind of normal. You know, I said, no, there was some emotion, but uh, he kept asking us, were you scared? And I said, no, that's not the right word. We were concerned and you know, we'd been, as I said earlier, kind of trained to, to uh, swallow the panic. And um, so when he left, I didn't think he was going to make a movie I, because he, he kept saying, or he, he must have asked us a half dozen times if we were scared. And... Uh, but about 30 days later, I got a call and said, uh, and it was from Ron, said, you want to be a technical advisor? I'm going to make the movie. 
And I said, sure. I didn't know what it was, what I was saying. It took, what I was saying is it took six months out of my life. <laughs> and traveling back and forth to California and all the location and all that stuff. And, um, but it was fascinating, fascinating. And, and uh, at that first meeting in Houston, Tom Hanks was there, Kevin Bacon, Bill Paxton, he had a Universal Studios, the writer, uh, there was a whole host of them. And getting to know those people from that first time was really fun. And, uh, and so I went out and did that movie and it was funny when I, I had a jaded view of Hollywood. I thought they were mostly fluff. And, uh, but when you start at the top with somebody like Ron Howard and Tom Hanks, uh, uh, it reminded me of the space business. It was very devoted to a goal. Work whatever hours it took. We would be there at seven in the morning, go till 11 at night. And by golly, we were back there at seven in the morning and keep on going. And so it, it changed my view. Now, when I've told people in the movie industry that, they say, yeah, but you started at the top. You didn't start at the bottom. <laughs> you didn't work your way up. You started at the top. Well, then contact came along. And, and that, that was an interesting one because it was before we, we were in, uh, still in production on 13 when uh, one of the gals, she was an executive producer, went to work on contact she left and i don't know where she got and bob zemeckis who was the uh, director of contact uh also did forrest gump and others he's excellent guy uh, he was they were in pre-production and in a meeting uh he said i need a nasa guy although this is fiction this is carl sagan's book i need a nasa guy that knows something about how to make this look right and uh so this gal who had been working on, on uh, Apollo 13 said, I know a guy, his name's Jerry Griffin. And, and I bet Sandy would agree with me. That's the way most of the, a lot of stuff gets done in Hollywood is who That's you right. know, is, right. and it's word of mouth, it get passed on. Because That's the same right. thing happened to go to Deep Impact. But in contact, that was, you know, gosh, I, fascinating. I, I got a call and said, Jody Foster would like to meet with you before we start shooting and go through uh, the script and the book. So I said, okay. So I was glad to do that. So I went out to, flew out to, they flew me out there and, and, to, and she's got her own production company called Egg, E-G-G, -G, Egg Production. And uh, I sat down with her and when I walked in, she had the Carl Sagan book is about that thick call contact. Uh, she had put post-its in every time she had a question. And we sat there for half a day and I answered all of them except a couple of that. I said, I'll have to call you back on that. She, but Tom, Tom Hanks did the same thing. He was asking us, why did you do this mid-course correction? And so those really top actors, uh, they do their homework. Uh, and uh, so it's a, Fascinating. Again, I learned a lot. Uh, that was more creative. I got to use the other side of my brain a little bit. Um, there was one piece in there. I'll tell you a quick story that, and I never could get Zemeckis to take it out because he said Carl Sagan had told him that all the astronauts carried cyanide pills. So when we were shooting off, off uh, Jody off to to uh, Vega, a star. Uh, they had this, there's a moment in the movie where the flight surgeon comes in and says, we'd like for you to have this. Uh, and she said something like, what is it? And they said, cyanide or something. Anyway, said, in case you need it, said, we've done this on every mission. And I, it was the last piece that I argued with him. I said, we didn't do it on every mission. He said, well, Carl Sagan said you, said you did. And I said, Carl wasn't there, <laughs> you know, and, uh, but anyway, I never could get him to take it out. So it's still in the movie. Then came along Deep Impact. That was one where there was, you could go split a comet um, and try to save the earth. And that was Robert Duvall, who was a, boy, you talk about fun uh, to work with. Kind of different. Uh, 
intense. Uh, and, uh, but he had me come back to his horse farm in uh, Virginia, which is where he lives, uh, not too far outside Washington. And he, he, uh, he said, uh, he said, I don't know much about this stuff. And I spent a weekend with him at his place. And we went not only through the script, which we had a draft of at that time, he wanted to know what things meant, but he also wanted to know how to hold his hand on a hand controller. Do you hold it lightly or do you hold it firmly, you know? And because he was the commander of this spaceship. And uh, so I told him that if you look in the movie, uh, it's a light touch, you know, you don't grab it like, like you're trying to squeeze something out of it. And, uh, but he was fun to work with. Diff totally different. Uh, had a, at that time, I think they're married now, but he had, he was about 65, I guess, something like that. Yeah, Argentinian girlfriend, it was 29, I think. And uh, I think they're married now, but anyway, he was a fun guy to work with, but he was very intense. He, uh, unlike Tom Hanks, who was loose as everything. The final one over here is uh, Apollo 18. That's probably not looking right, is it? It's over here, it's the other way. That last chair is Apollo 18. And it was, we shot that in Canada in Vancouver. Um, it was uh, it was a uh, uh, oh gosh, the, the director, the, the owners that producers that get themselves in trouble. One of them. Anyway, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, but it was an interesting, it was totally, totally off the wall. They wanted me for the look, which looks very much like Apollo. But it was a case where, where uh, it started off normal. There was an 18th mission and it landed on the moon, but they found something there. And long story short, it becomes paranormal. Uh, it was not a high budget film. Uh, I had fun making it, but, but uh, I spent a lot of time in Vancouver, next four or five months uh, all together. And uh, but it was fun. And, and uh, but that's my four movies and the, the middle two, the contact and deep impact, I got in front of the camera. Uh, so I am now a member of the Screen Actors Guild uh, and uh, I still get residuals on those two. So uh, my message to everybody is buy the DVDs, uh, <laughs> do the paper, do pay-per-view anytime you can. Uh, uh, we all get, a, all of us that are involved get a chunk of that. And uh, so, uh, but that was my movie career. Me. My, I keep telling people I haven't lately found a script I like. You know, I'm trying to be. Uh, and uh, <laughs> my wife tells me you're just washed up. That's uh, you know. And so she's right. She's right. I, but but I'm I keep looking for that really good script that'll be me. <laughs> and, uh, I was, well, we can't wait until you find it, and I'm sure Sandy can speak to the same thing. And I want to ask Sandy some questions too. I want to just mention, sure. because I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't, the Cosmosphere was also involved in Apollo 13. And um, one of the gentlemen who led that effort is actually in our streaming room with me today. And he probably was just right there um, with you emotionally. Um, Jack Graber was part of our Spaceworks crew and is part of our Spaceworks crew. We still are involved. and. Our Hollywood experiences happen just like yours. It's, I know a guy. Well, in yeah. Hollywood, they know a company who either has artifacts that can make a movie complete or can create replicas. And we've been very fortunate to be involved in some interesting situations too. But we did create 80% of the props, right, Jack? And, mm -hmm. and some suits, was that right? For Apollo 13. So we were in spirit there with me, Jerry. Let and, me let me interject, Mamie, that sure. the first day on the set in California, the name Cosmosphere came up because the set was absolutely incredible. It was so good. And the consoles were and 
and it was either Ron or Tom, Tom Hanks. Somebody said, "Yeah, those, you know, those were, those came from Cosmosphere," and uh, that uh, refurbed and and uh, and put in this condition. That room they had taken down to the inch to 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 make it right. And I, I, somebody asked me, I think it was Hanks in the first day that we were there. He said, well, where did you live? And I said, about a half mile in that direction. I was sitting on a set in California and I said, about a half mile in that direction. It felt just like I was in the control center. So I just wanted to say great job that, uh, that the Cosmosphere did on that because it was, it was perfect. It looked just like the real room. Uh, well, we're very proud of that involvement. And that's a perfect segue to a story that Sandy told me. And Sandy, when you were on a movie set, when you were acting with famous people, I feel like, I don't know, that I, I just feel like I'm in great company today. And uh, all of you have neat shares and neat experiences, but Sandy's carried back a Cosmosphere story. So tell us that. I just love well, it was, you know, it, it was sharing this, this with you, Jerry, earlier that when I was working on a Ron Howard movie, I um, was very lucky to spend some, some time with Ron and Vince Vaughn and his brother Clint, who's also in Apollo 13 as one of the mission controllers. And so longtime fan of the movie and the, the background and obviously had worked at the cause. And I'd worked at the cause as a counselor when Space Works uh, was building the set piece. So knew about it sort of in the in the hallways of the institution and people were really excited to be a part of the project. So fast forward 20 years later and I'm in Chicago on this movie. And when you're when you're shooting movies, you have a lot of downtime. So people often will say, I really want to go watch a, a day of a movie. And you're like, bring a book because there's really not a lot to do. It's, it actually can be really dull. There's some exciting moments, but really a lot of setup and, and a lot of downtime. And so you find that you just you just have downtime and just kind of talk about whatever. And we ended up hanging out a bit. And I said, you know, Ron, I have to ask you about Apollo 13. I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that I used to work at the Cosmosphere and went there as a camper. And he lit right up and talked about what a great experience it was. And it was it was really striking that he said, that's the, the one movie that he watches all the way through. And if you think of someone like Ron Howard, who's got probably 40 or 50 movies that he's been a part of and been a part of film and TV is literally his whole life and his brother Clint as well, that both of them immediately lit up about Apollo 13 and said, anytime it's on TV, we have to watch it all the way through. We just, we can't not watch it. And they were like, we're in it and we made it and we got to watch it. Like we know, we know exactly what happens. So I thought that was pretty cool. And it's, it's a testament, you know, not only to the story, but how like, that problem solving element, right? That that yeah. brings you in, it sucks you in and, and you have to watch it to the end to see these guys come home. Do, do you watch it, Jerry, when it's, I do. When it's in on? Fact, yeah. when I, if I'm surfing around and, and see it, I can't get off of it. And, you know, and so I'll catch it in the middle and that's, so I just watch it till the end, you know? And uh, I think that that last part of that is, is, uh, is very, uh, exciting and then you know i know exactly how it comes out but uh all of that but it, it's just the way they the way he shot that and the way he did it, it it's effective it, it's really really good and um so he made some magic uh, uh with that film i think and like i say he kept telling me he said this is not a documentary i've got to have some poetic li or artistic license uh, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. And uh, but uh, he uh, he's a delightful person, as you know. You, Sandy, you've dealt with him, and he he's really down to earth. And uh, his he had in that those kids are all grown now, but he had these these kids. They they look the boy looked just like Opie uh, in the old uh, uh, Mayberry or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. and, um mm -hmm. and andy griffith show mm -hmm. and uh red-headed freckle face a little bit and uh, yeah those kids are all grown now so uh but he's just a down-to-earth really neat guy uh, and he's so prepared too i think that was something that struck in, in tying back to the simulation and training element that we're talking about but the the prep on a movie set that everybody's doing their homework jerry like you were saying yeah. especially the folks at the top and if you're a director you know every single piece of what you're going to be achieving on yep. a day so they always say like on the day here's what we're looking to do it's all about making a day 
and they and as a side note you never really ask when you're going to wrap you know if no. you, you if someone says Just keep going you know, when are we wrapping? You go, we got you for the whole, for the whole six months, right? I think we're good. Yeah, yeah. I think you just yeah, you yeah. wrap when you wrap. But, yeah. but the, the set environment is actually pretty chill. A lot of people are working really hard. Everybody's in their own lane. You have a number of departments who are very effectively talking together on a number of different comm channels who have different, you know, siloed objectives to meet. But at the same time, they're working on this bigger goal. We have to get this one shot exactly right. And so you might have a couple dozen departments with department heads and and folks who are are parts of those teams coming together. So you might have a, on, on a movie that size, you have easily a few hundred people and oh, yeah. tons of big bands yeah. outside and the whole thing. And yeah, you know the chefs. But the the point that I think is really relevant is that they're prepared, and because yep. of that, they're surprisingly chill. I was surprised at how fun it was and it was there really wasn't a lot of pressure you, you built in time to do more takes and to have some fun especially with Vince Vaughn who's knows, known for improvising and, and known for kind of going with the moment so it, it was a lot of fun and surprisingly pretty laid back yeah in fact Ron, Ron's favorite word was that was a great take great take let's do one more and then <laughs> they go to set up and they do, do another and say that was really good let's do one more and so we started calling, let's do one more, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's good. That, he's that's, good. that's really funny. We'd always get caught up in these side convos and then someone would go, we need to start shooting. Get a good. He'd always say, we'll talk, we'll talk, we'll talk, we'll talk. Yeah. Let's, then you'd go into the next like moment. Well, I think it's amazing because can it back to the leadership lessons, can you imagine completing a task in your business or in your life and then having somebody say, that was great. Let's do it again. <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But to that, to that point of improvisation and what you said about Vince Vaughn, Sandy, I want to just bring it home to you real quickly to, to bring us back to yes and, and I've got your back. So we just touched on that at the beginning. How does that look in a real conversation or in a real improv environment that could be the improvisation that we all do every day in our mm -hmm. jobs when the day does not go always as we plan. It's a, it's a great question. And specifically, it's all about listening. In the moment, it's all about listening and building on what someone else is saying. So you know, a lot of people think that improv is about um, making people laugh or I have to think of something funny on the spot or I have to be quick on my feet. And it's really more about being wired to set the other person up to succeed and have a team and ensemble orientation. And in this got your back environment, when you're improvising without a script, we're all improvising every single day. We may have a mission plan, but something changes. Really all you have to rely on is data and your team and the people you're working with. It's all about the people. And so if you're working with the team and you have an orientation to say, look, I have your back. I'm here to support you regardless. Let's get this thing done. It takes the ego away, takes your agenda away, but then it also helps kind of level set everybody. So everybody can kind of take a breath and go, all right, cool. The other thing is that people, I think, often forget to just pause and take a second and breathe and go, what's going on? Where are we at here? You know, and there's, I think people put a lot of pressure on themselves. I do this. We all do this. Think right away, have a really quick, perfect answer. And we don't always have that. And, but you need to take a second and kind of orient and put your team members and level set and go, all right, here's where we're at and here's what we're going to do. Right. We need built in hold on our way to launch. Is that right, Jerry? That That's right. We, you can call it a pause, a gap, but everybody needs to, we get in this headlong rush. Okay. I'm going to use the I word. I get in a headlong rush because I like to get things done. But when I do step back and take a breath, it makes all the difference. And thank you for that, Sandy. I just, I think that's yeah. an invaluable lesson. So now I'm just gonna ask each of you for last remarks and we're gonna wrap things up here. So Jerry, what, what are your thoughts on this day and anything you wanna leave with our audience? Well, there's a couple of thoughts. One is, and I should have said this at the beginning, I wanna, congratulate the Cosmosphere for doing this kind of thing and, and you're, you're excellent at it. Uh, I, I'd like to 
see you continue and and uh, and and don't give up even while we're in this strange situation we're in now. But uh, back to the space program, I think I really think the future holds really some good good stuff. The commercial aspects of what we're seeing now, um, I think, are really outstanding. I think I think Blue Origin is going to come online soon now with and actually be flying suborbital uh, uh, tourists, if you will. And then, but they're turning out big stuff at the Cape now. They got their own launch pad, and they're gonna they're gonna get that uh, that orbital rocket uh, prepared. And it's a big one. It is a big big rocket. SpaceX has done some things that I've never would have thought possible. That landing that first stage rocket back on a on they did it last night, by the way, again, um, landing the first stage back on a platform out in the middle of the ocean. Uh, are at the Cape on the land. Um, but then NASA has got, they've got an exciting program, the Artemis program that you've mentioned. Uh, I happened to be down at Johnson Space Center about two weeks ago and got a look at, at the uh, Orion spacecraft uh, in the mock-up in Building 9's a high bay area where they put this kind of stuff, full-scale mock-up of the Orion spacecraft. And then I saw a full-scale mock-up of the uh, Blue Origin National Team's uh, uh, human landing system. And that's got a, they call it an ascent element instead of an ascent stage. And then it's got the descent stage, or they call it descent element. Um, that looks kind of like, kind of like Apollo on steroids. It's, they are so much bigger, but the, and the technology just looks slick as heck. If they can keep, the, the big question is gonna be the funding. Can they keep it on track? Um, is the new administration gonna stay with Artemis and, and try to make it happen? I hope so. Uh, because I think NASA uh, has got their act together and I think they they can do well. Uh, and my thought, final thought on all this is, why do we do all this? Well and this is not global warming, I'm not gonna mention it's bigger than that. Someday, we're gonna use this planet. We're gonna use it up. Uh, the resources and all that it just, if you look at places in the solar system and outside our solar system, it's just the way it's gonna happen. It may be 1,000 years, 5,000, 10,000 years from now, who knows? I think it's incumbent on us to begin, the human species, if we want it to survive, to learn how to move around in deep space, because we're probably, if we want for the species to survive, I think we're gonna have to get off this planet one day. And we can't do it uh, in a year. We've got to learn how to do that now. That's why I think going back to the moon, onto Mars, those are little teeny baby steps in this, what I'm talking about. We've got to learn how to go to Alpha Centauri or somewhere else. And the star, one of the planets of Alpha Centauri, that's four and a half, what, four and a half light years away. So we've just scratched the surface. And I think we need to keep a percentage, a small percentage as it is of the national uh, treasure aimed in that direction. We're not, uh, NASA's not at all the, it's not nearly the size of DOD and people think it is, but it's not, it's very small. And um, comparatively, it's still a lot of money, but that's my message for the future. And that's why we need to get the kids prepared today to carry on and on and on. And so this is not just a one shot deal. It's let's stay after it. That's exactly what I was thinking. I thought, so all the young people who are going to help us prepare for that, whether they're scouts, we have specific camps for scouts where they learn all those skills and get to earn badges here. We have curriculum tied to our camps specifically to help prepare the next generations for thinking through that kind of scenario and how to do it together. So Another shameless plug for Come to Cosmos, your camp. 
with that being said, let's throw it back to our former camper, Sandy. Oh, and Sandy, I have to apologize. I gave you an Emmy during the introduction when we were having a few technical difficulties here and I may not have been at focused at my finest. I think <laughs> I said she had earned several Emmys and I don't wanna get you in trouble. But uh, thank you. I think you should it's, have. Sorry. Well, anyway. that's delightful. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. I'll I will um take that verbal accommodation. It was nominated. We were nominated for uh for a, a television special um back in the day with my group Schadenfreude in Chicago. Um yeah, the thanks so much for that. I think building on the idea of focusing on the youth and education, it really is is about the education piece. It goes back to the one of the first slides we were sharing, Jerry, you know, with an old cover from the training manual that said nothing is impossible and teamwork is key. When you're talking about, you know, one day going to one of the planets around Alpha Centauri, that's not impossible. That's that's actually possible. We can get there, but it will require collaboration, working together, teamwork, these lessons that we've learned from you today around, you know, how how can we focus on what worked in the mission control environment to become you know, better day-to-day -day collaborators. There's a saying in improvisation that goes, uh, you know, play the scene you're in, not the scene you want to be in. So it's play the scene you're in, not the scene you want to be in. It's it's really hard for uh, anybody who's working to be present to keep that in mind, myself included. But it's it's today now more than ever, we are playing the scene we're in, not the scene we want to be in. And it's big kudos, Jerry, like you were saying to the Cosmosphere for putting on events like this virtually, for adapting to the virtual environment to keeping these conversations going. And look, as a, as a lifelong fan of the Cosmosphere, former camper, former counselor, a big part of that was really seeing that there's a lot of ways people can get involved in space and space exploration, right? Even around communications right. and, and facilitating stories and paying attention to what we can what we can learn from folks like you. So uh, thanks to Mimi and Jim and Michelle and Jack and everybody at the Cos and Jerry, it's just a, it's a pinch me honor to get to, to sit and be a part of these conversations and hear these stories. It, it truly is. I feel like we're all playing it cool, but it's the coolest thing ever. And we're just, we're learning so much. So, you know, on, on behalf of everybody, thanks for your time. We're really honored. Well, my, ple my, my pleasure, my pleasure. Well, it is such an honor. And, you know, we planned to do this in person with the huge gala we had planned in 2020 for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 13. And I so enjoy all of the incredible um, men, now men and women who are involved in those efforts. And I, I too forget, Sandy, when the astronauts and mission control heroes are here because you're all so accommodating and so wonderful to come to the Cosmosphere, but we are so honored that you pick up the phone when we call and we are ready to have you back. So to everybody in our audience today, thank you for joining us virtually. Please stay tuned, subscribe to the Cosmosphere newsletter so you know when we can all gather here in person for more lessons from the likes of Jerry Griffin, to hear more from Sandy about how we can incorporate those lessons into our own teams, and to continue to learn the lessons from the history of manned spaceflight that the Cosmosphere preserves so that we can each be our best today. Thank you for joining us. And for those of you who are sending in questions at the last minute, we'll get those to Jerry and to Sandy and we'll make sure we get you answers. Thanks for being with us at the Cosmosphere and tune in again soon. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Bye everyone.